proud of this and very pleased, and this is what we need to do. Because if you worship the gods of your enemy, then you've become your enemy. And so, any time you engage in worship, you engage in carrying forward the aspirations of your enemy's ancestors or your ancestors. So depending on who you worship, that's whose ancestors' aspirations you carry forward. And we know what our enemy's ancestors' aspirations were for us. So we have to be very clear. We are in big trouble, yet we are in relatively good time. But we're not up against an enemy that's standing still and you just chip away and eventually he'll disappear. You're up against an enemy that's very aggressively trying to destroy you. And if you have been studying and staying focused, you will know that the European community is at zero birth rate worldwide. Russia expects in the next 20 years to lose 33 million people. Germany has already calculated that in the last 20, they've lost 5 million people. What zero birth rate means is that we've got more people dying from natural causes than we having birth of natural causes. You understand? Yeah. And so they've created all these artificial ways of trying to give birth, but it's not keeping up. But what has resulted, not wanting to succumb to what Dr. Welsing spoke about, genetic annihilation, they're, when they're about the job of genociding us. At least keeping us at a management level, a manageable level. And AIDS has been the primary and the most effective tool they've found. In North America, it is drugs and the penal system that is the most effective tool for managing our population growth. So you have to be conscious of who you are and where you are, and no matter how much illusion you can get involved in about, you know, you ask black folks, are you an African-American? Well, I'm not, I'm mixed. But nobody ever celebrates the mixed days. They only celebrate the African stuff. So Africa is the only race on Earth. There's only one race on this planet. It's the African race. What has occurred in time and space is those who have deviated through natural mutilation away from the primary biological stock have been socialized to oppose nature, thus opposing God. So you have a culture of people who's in opposition to nature. If you're in opposition to nature, you're in opposition to life. And if you're not to nature and life, you're in opposition to God. Well, those parts of the human family that had to succumb to the two major ice ages, and we reference them now as Europeans or Asiatics for the most part, have built a culture that is in opposition to life itself, and certainly see themselves as competitors with the God itself and they really think they have become God. And so the very things that have made them powerful now kill them from cancer and all kinds of incurable diseases that has resulted from the synthetics that they've created from the natural products in nature. And we too live in that ecology, the artificial ecology, so we are suffering from the same thing. And because they've already also created an artificial spirituality, a spirituality that makes us think because we add African essence to the artificial spirituality, we confuse ourselves into thinking that we got something spiritual going on. So you go to a church and be throwing down, even I got a shout, because that choir sounds so good. That's that African essence loaned to someone else's misconception of spirituality, and that convinced our lowly educated consciousness that we are projecting something spiritual. No, what we are doing is projecting African essence around something that's really diabolical and not spiritual. And so I'm going to do a lot of reading today. And Baba told me I could take as much time as I need, but I'm not going to bury y'all too much, but it's going to be a few hours. But the information it's going to be at least two hours, maybe three. But there's a lot of information because we are in big trouble and we don't know why. Because if you challenge even persons in the struggle 
around the question of God and religion, they will still defend the integrity of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If you challenge them on the essence of any of those three things, they don't know a damn thing about it. They know some basic scripture. They know some basic tenets. They know some basic prayers. And they know the protocol of the temple, which is shang, shout, where you sit and what kind of clothes you wear. Mm -hmm. They have no real idea. It's like some people tell you, oh, well, Christianity started in Africa. That's not true. They say, well, the Ethiopians have the oldest church. That's not true. You know? So we need to, like, really not... We don't need to lie to ourselves about our history to have history. And the diabolical Jew will never embrace Nazis to try to proclaim some relationship to their technical achievement. So why do we embrace our Nazis? And we only do it out of fear and ignorance. And so I'm going to try to address some of that fear and some of that ignorance. Because it's important to understand, as my definition of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and I like to really open up with that, that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual and cultural system. Fragments from the periphery. They're not even a part of our core. Okay? Fragments from the periphery. And so as I go through tonight, even though I may get a little, it won't be my usual spontaneous kind of thing, because I'm going to be reading a lot of stuff, but I want to give you some information so that when you buy this tape, you can really try to look at some base stuff and then add your own research to it. And challenge anything I say. Don't believe nothing I've got to say. One of the worst things about us is that we've become believers instead of knowers. Okay? Take information from any source that appears to be informative and good, but then check that information out for its validity, me or anybody else. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice to your own consciousness, and you're not going to grow. My attempt is to give you information. I will make mistakes. As you move on with the information, you will get rid of mistakes and add new things to it. So <clears throat> we're going to move on in the evening. I'm waiting for Reverend Brown to really get himself set up like he wants to. But this becomes important because the true war that we have with our enemies is the war for spiritual consciousness. Okay. Everybody in this room will go through the process we call death. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how handsome you are. I don't care how intellectually educated you are. I don't care how technically trained you are. I don't care how much wisdom you've acquired. We are all going to die. So it's important then to know what is death. And if your only reference to the knowledge of death comes from your enemy, and he uses the fear of death to keep you in check, then you better question what his definition of death is. Because before we were here in this consciousness, before we were here in this manifestation, we existed according to our culture. That means we've been in existence longer than we've been in this expression. Matter of fact, no matter whose tradition you deal with theocratically or theologically, you cannot have a God and then have anything else. If you have a supreme being, it is the only thing that can exist. Nothing else can exist. If anything else exists, then you have more than one supreme being. So then, if you understand that, and that's right out of African tradition across the continent, that the only thing that exists is the creator, then what the heck are you? You are but an aspect of its expression in time and space. Some of us like to say we are being, having a human experience. But if you were anything other than an aspect of the being, then you yourself would be a being equal to that being. 
So the only thing that exists in the African notion of spirituality is God. And there is no notion in any African cultural center of a devil. There actually is no notion of right and wrong. There's just the notion of either being ignorant to what is appropriate or being enlightened to what is appropriate. And if you're ignorant to what is appropriate, you will suffer a consequence because of that ignorance. So it's important to become enlightened, and that's what culture was about. Culture was not about entertainment. Culture was about education, about bringing outside of you what was appropriate for you to be in harmony with the rest of the nature that you were a part of. And that's what music was used for, and that's what dance was used for, and that's what drama was used for. Now it's used to artificially entertain and stimulate you so that you will not reflect on reality. If you can turn it down just a little bit. So we probably won't even need it if you can hear me in the back. And as I go along, I usually go up. I start off with a soft bass, but it, it gets up there. So you understand where I'm going. Because either we are Africans or we're not. See, many of us, myself included, for a long period of time, and probably because of ignorance to a great degree, are playing African. We put on the symbols of Africa, but we don't want to take on the essence of Africa. To take on the essence of Africa, then you have to see yourself as God expressing itself in this time and space. And that means your responsibility is for the world. That means you have authority over the world. If you're not ready to take responsibility for the world, you can't have authority over the world. And if you don't take authority over the world, somebody in the world will have authority over you. And that's what our situation is. Somebody has decided to take authority over you. Tells you when they want you to die, tell you when they want you to live. Tell you what degree you can express your living and what degree you can't. It tells you whether you can love your mate or tells you when you can't. It tells you how to handle your children and tells you how you shouldn't. And we try to comply because we want to hang on to what is called life, yet none of us can determine when we're going to die, and none can determine how much time we've got. Some people will live to be 100 plus. Some won't make it to two. And you really don't know when that number is. I've had three clinical deaths, and I'm still kicking. I often wonder, who is this after all? you know, but nature wasn't ready for my recycling, and so it regurgitated me back up. But whatever process and use I have in nature and time. So I'm going to start with just some little things that I wrote down. Now, Dr. John Henry Clark said, history sometimes tells you where you have been in order to tell you where you are. So you can estimate where you still have to go. Dr. Clark said, and who betrayed the African World Revolution, remember, slavery is never abolished. Slavery is transformed. Now it's computerized. Only the slave can destroy slavery. You cannot destroy slavery by becoming part of your slave master's cultural incubator. Return to an African methodology of human and societal development. That was the message that ancestors left for us, and we need to really study that seriously. I wrote this, and I call it testifying. It's just a couple of words. You are but cells in the body of God. Nothing in nature is your enemy. Only ignorance of your relationship, lacking knowledge today to build institutions. For example, we eat collard greens, right? And we said we eat collard greens because it gives us iron, it gives us this, and it gives us that, right? If you have to eat collard greens to replenish yourself, then you and collard greens are the same thing, aren't you? You eat other food to get protein, whatever, and if you can be replenished and reconstructed because your body is dying millions of cells every day and recreating new cells every day from what you ingested from the rest of the ecology, doesn't that tell you right there you are one with all that exists? 
And if you are one with all that exists, then the struggle should be for ma'at, harmony, balance in the universe. Every system in nature and the solar system is in your mind, your role, your family, extended family, race or nation. Sparrows must follow the instructions of their ancestors. Instruct and inform by your ancestors. If you do not get instructed and informed by your ancestors, and you take instructions and information from somebody else's ancestors, you're going to be a mutant, like we are. We are psycho-spiritual mutants of white diabolicalism. Because a sparrow, if it took instruction from a robin's ancestor, that sparrow would be a mutant. It would be a cripple, wouldn't it? Even though they're both birds, aren't they? So in order for the sparrow to be the sparrow, it must take its primary instruction from the ancestors and the gene pool and the DNA and the RNA of sparrows, not robin, even though they're both birds. We Africans must ask ourselves who instructs and informs our consciousness on how to be a being in this world. And I know some of you say, well, Jesus, my Jesus, sweet fantasy of white energy in my consciousness saved my soul. The only reason we called on Jesus because it was death to call on anything else. Jesus didn't transform the Africans during slavery who heard about it. The Africans transformed Jesus. The degree to which Christianity in America have any credibility is the degree to which the Africans took that sick view of reality and gave it spiritual credibility. But if you don't study and see what we did with it, you will think the white man gave you something credible. And you won't see that you took something that was incredible and made it credible. You understand what I'm saying? Because this is important to understand. Because our children, even the best of us, in struggle, our children that we give birth to are being influenced, impacted, and directed by the socialization process of the rest of society. And we have to struggle just to keep our offspring focused on just basic survival, let alone really seeing what we've been trying to tell them. Because everything in the culture is designed to murder things African. So if you struggle to bring African into being in your consciousness and you give birth to a child in this society, it doesn't possess what you possess because all of the machinery from the time you went to a hospital and had them put you through the process to give birth in the wrong unhealthy manner to start with, they went at war against your offspring. And when we send them to the schools, thinking we're sending them to the best schools, so we're going to send them someplace where that's not in the ghetto, and realizing that we are defaming ourselves by calling our community a ghetto to start with. We live in communities. It may be under attack by our enemies, but we don't live in ghettos. Our enemies want us in ghettos, but what are we choosing for ourselves? How are we defining where we are for ourselves? And because he can convince us that we live in ghettos and our schools can't work, we don't even go to the schools to make them work. We send our children to our enemy who we haven't even transformed us. And now mold this for me. And he murders it and sends it back. And you go into crisis trying to figure out what happened. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Because that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with psycho-spiritual terrorism. And you got to understand that. It's very important <clears throat> that we understand psycho-spiritual terrorism. So that when we begin to look at economic terrorism, we can see why economic terrorism is so effective against us because the psycho-spiritual terrorism have been so successful. We'll be talking, of course, about principles. And principles is a law of nature as formulated and accepted by the mind, an essential truth upon which other truth is based.
the acceptance of moral law as a guide to behavior, a rule by which a person chooses to govern his or her conduct, often forming part of a code, the elements or rudiments of any art, science, or discipline. So we must think in terms of principles, concepts, and ideas. Principle, concepts, and ideas. Those are the three areas, categories that we're going to use in terms of engines to construct our personality and our character. I've written a definition for spirituality too that I like to use, but first I want to reiterate, we must return to ancestral consciousness as a way of transforming consciousness. Only by advancing African consciousness will we achieve African liberation. Restore African and our ancestral cultural integrity. This will allow us to resist European ideas, socialization, and begin to reestablish our ways of balance, harmony, and justice, or ma'at. Let me try and explain so you really get it. We know past, present, and future as the three spheres of time. Africa know only one sphere. Okay? The future doesn't exist. It never exists. It is aspiration. It is dreams. It is hope. It inspires and it motivates you to be. But it doesn't really exist. And you can't go to it and borrow anything to build anything with. That's tangible. You can be stimulated and motivated by the aspirations for what is possible. The present is incomplete because it's coming into being. It doesn't exist yet. You're creating in the present. You're bringing into being. There's nothing there completed for you to use to build anything with. Only in the past, only in the past can you find completed models, blueprints, of concepts, ideas, and principles with which to construct your aspirations you call future in your presence. And the very instant that you've completed a construction in the present and realize a future, it becomes the past again to instruct and to inform. And that's why ancestors, which is the past, is essential to be your instructors and your informants. Whether they were enslaved, whether they were a prostitute on the corner, whether they were a junkie standing in a doorway. Because that junkie and that prostitute was you that simply got damaged more than the you that's looking at them by the enemy's blows. But within the context of having to struggle against those blows, even they have wisdom that can keep you and your children from ending up in that doorway or on that street corner. So you've got to listen to your ancestors and be instructed and informed by their experiences. Spirituality, in the final analysis, is the resulting condition, habits, principles, concepts, ideas, rituals, practice, from being instructed and informed by your ancestors. It is, of course, God the creator, our creation itself, that are and is our primary ancestor. That our obligation on this experience is to be exactly like what we call God. That is the primary role model for how you want to behave. We know that culture the training and development of the mind, the refinement of tastes and manners acquired by such training, and again, spirituality is systemic understanding of your relationship to the rest of nature and the universe, and process and methods used to stay in harmony with all that exists. Culture again, the social and religious structures and intellectual and artistic manifestation, etc., that characterizes society, the rearing, the cultivating, in a preparated way, 
and to prepare at least the minimum and minimum the next generation to cultivate, to prepare, to raise, to improve, to refine, to cause to develop. And what do you want to cause to develop? The psychological being, the physiological being, the sociological being, and the spiritual being. And so we need to make sure that in doing this, we don't get carried away like some of us get out there on the spiritual skills and then we out in outer space someplace and we have no connection to reality. You must stay focused on food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. That the energy you're expanding, you're expanding because in order to breathe and live for the next few days or weeks, you must have food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. Don't just get out and say, I'm, I'm on a spiritual trip, and we out there not being responsible to the most fundamental reality. In order to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security, you must then be clear that you must control land, you must control political institutions, you must control educational institutions, you must control health care services in your community, you must control police and security in your community. You can't do any of this unless you clear on three areas, economics, politics, and culture. You cannot separate them from spirituality. You cannot separate them from nation building. Economic, politics, and culture. Economic is control of your ecology and what it produces and what you can extract from it. In the continent of Africa, we have diamond, gold, oil, cobalt, tungsten, you name it. But in Philadelphia, what you have primarily in your ecology is your tax revenue and your youth. And if you have not developed the wisdom to have your tax revenue that have been extracted from you in the course of 12 months, and it comes back to your state and your city in terms of airmark money, and if you do not have the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding how to get access to that capital so it serves you for your needs, then you don't know anything about economics. I don't care what you know about bookkeeping, accounting, or banking. Because those are just tools of economics. They are not economics. Then there's politics. And we made a great mistake in the 60s, many of us. We drove the white man from the city, and we did not fill the political vacuum. We left, we drove him out. Then we waited until he came back so we can have another fight with trying to drive him out again. Politics is the management system for your economics. Politics determine how you divvy up what is economic, what is extracted from the ecology as well. Politics makes the rules and regulations you must follow so no one violates the equitable distribution of the wealth. And then there's culture. At the center of culture, is your spiritual system, and at the center of your spiritual system is your notion of God, and at the center of your notion of God should be what we don't have, a secret society that protects the integrity of the group. You can't be a Mason and be secret because the white boy controls that. You understand? So you have to spawn your own secret society, and it must come out of your notion of God, and that must come down as a long, slender black line from your ancestors so no one can penetrate that. You see? That is your army that protects the integrity of the group that no one can touch. You may hate the mafia, but Italians love them because that's their army. They protect their integrity. Culture instructs and informs your politics in whose interest the economics must serve. You understand? Economic, politics, and culture for the purpose of providing food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for you, your extended family, and your greater nation. Grasping the notion of spiritual consciousness, returning to instructions and information from your ancestors. And the way you do that is through reading books, through traveling, through listening to the oral tradition, through listening to our music, through studying, through learning how to dance, 
through learning how to meditate and accessing what's already in your own consciousness, those are the ways you commune with ancestors, to come together as you do in this temple and share your energy and share your different experiences and allow the experience of your different ancestors to manifest in the sphere with information that's useful to others. That's how you learn to commune with your ancestors. Don't get confused that you can burn a couple of candles and if you burn a yellow one and a white one and a blue one and you got the right incense, something gonna float down on the sky. Um, Ogun gonna come down wearing some sword and stuff. Ogun is an aspect of your consciousness when realized. There ain't nothing out there. It is also in the greater ecology, yes, and in the greater cosmos, but you can't even realize it out there until you realize it in here. I'm going to deal near the end with traditional religion, but just to give you a sense of what we are talking about when we get there, because <clears throat> I'm initiated to the Yoruba tradition, and I'm initiated to the shrine of Oya. When we think of Shango, which you're familiar with, we think I'm the god of thunder and the god of lightning. Well, that's just a metaphorical anthropomorphic representation of what the power would look like if you could make it physical. But there was no person like that. Shango is the realization within each and every one of us that we've become aware of the courage necessary for spiritual growth and development. When you realize or accept the courage within you that's necessary for you to grow and develop, then you must have a relationship at least with two other forces that the, the, the ancestors have recommended. You must have a relationship with Oya. Oya, who becomes the wife of Shango, represents change in process. Once Shango, that aspect of your consciousness, realizes the need for change, then it must marry change which is Oya, the wind, as a symbol, meaning wind blows away the negative and the profane and cleanses the ecology for the new to come into being. Oya is married to both Shango and Ogun. Ogun is transformation, the result of change. You understand? So ancestors weren't doing no boogeyman stuff. They had a system of education to instruct and inform their consciousness and they created symbols and anthropomorphic imagery to train their youth and to keep in focus with one another so they could stay on course. We've allowed the enemies to write book and define our own spiritual culture to us. Well, we've got to go to them old folks. Y'all down here in Philly, y'all got a bunch of root people down here, but y'all scared of some of you. When we was down south, I grew up on a plantation place called Georgetown County, South Carolina. I'm talking backwoods, back, you don't get no more backwoods than Georgetown County. A little place called Acadia Plantation, down in between Myrtle Beach and Conway. And Mama was a root lady. Every single village had a root man or a root lady or both. And everybody understood the limitations of Western medicine, okay? Even white folks came to black folks and they had a thing to tell mama to tell mama what Miss Pigeon, that's what they call mama, her name was Miss Pigeon. Her name was Mary Magdalena, but since the Christians said Mary Magdalena was a whore, she changed her name from Mary Magdalena to Susan and took her dead sister's name who had drowned, and the community knew her as Miss Pigeon, you know, the bird lady, because she was the juju lady, you know. And so they would tell mama it's a snake bite. The snake bite means Western medicine can't do nothing for this here. The snake reference Vudun, because the great symbol of, of Vudun is the snake, the python, which was a symbol of the universe itself as the snake bites its tail and creates eternity. So, a snake bites, that only African stuff can cure this. And all over Philly, you got root people. And we know when things get real bad, we all sneak in by night. But what we need to do is start going to the root people's house by day. We need to legitimize and give credibility and then put demands on them who are not doing it the way it should be done, that they need to begin to do it the way it should be done. Because as perversion comes up in any society, 
and a culture is forced to pervert itself to survive, it will become a perverted expression of itself. And many of our people are violating out of ignorance and some out of greed the system of medicine and science and spirituality that our ancestors passed on. But for those of us who say we're in the vanguard of this development, we have to take the responsibility then to accept our system as real and legitimate and to make it legitimate, at least among us. But even those of us who are in the struggle, you are the exception having this temple. Many of us who are in the struggle are afraid to identify with African spiritual systems such as Vudun, such as Hudu, such as Yoruba, such as Ewe, such as Akan. We would rather masquerade as a Muslim to say in being a Muslim we're being anti-American or anti-Europe because that's acceptable to the enemy. But we rarely go past that except for few of us. And if you don't go past that, you're still in the cemetery. You still have the hangman's noose around your neck. How do we gain these institutional controls? I just explained. We master ecology and environment, turning riches into wealth. When you spend nearly $700 billion, as our people in America did last year, we have riches. How do we turn it into wealth? Politics is the sociology as economics is the ecology. Politics is your economic management system. It creates laws, regulations, and penalties. Culture is to education what politics is to sociology and what economics is to ecology. Education and spiritual system, the socialization process, which determines our values, interests, and principles. For whose interests we want these controls. We want to control self, we want to control family nuclear, we want to control family extended, we want to control community and family, we want to control race, and we want to build nation. What guides us to this understanding? As I said before, we must be instructed and informed by our ancestors. And that is my opening. And that I hope you really begin to grasp. Because time is running out. You had somebody blow up towers in New York. They got you chasing a Mr. Bin Laden all over the world who may never have existed to begin with. I'm not accepting the okie doke. You're going to send your children to watch Black Hawk Down. Some of you will go and watch it. 18 Americans died that day. Nearly 100 was wounded in Somalia. They killed nearly 3,000 Somalians on that day. So if I'm going to cry, and I'm not going to over 18 crackers and a couple of silly brothers, let me first mourn for the nearly 3,000 Somali, mostly women and children, that they slaughtered with their machine guns from their Black Hawk hel helicopter that does not discriminate when you're firing into a crowd of civilian areas. And I'm sure in that movie, they're not going to explain that to you. They're not going to explain to you that that dictator, what his name was, Biden, Biden, that General Adid and them overthrew, that America put into place in Somalia, that in that short period of time that he was there, he was put there by the Americans, and within a year, he had sold one-fourth of the exploration rights for oil in Somalia to four American oil companies, Amoco, Gulf, Chevron, and one other, and Adid and them drove those crackers out, and that's why they want to get back in, and that's why they're ships off the coast of Somalia now, trying to set up for the invasion, so they can restore those oil contracts to these big oil companies. They didn't even tell you that uh, Afghanistan, around the Caspian Sea area, have a 500-year oil reserve there, and that already gave them a couple of billion dollars to run the pipeline, but when the Afghans realized what the deal was, they said, this ain't enough. They were doing business with the Taliban. So the Taliban said, that ain't enough money. Even George Bush passed them a few million. Stop going to poppy because we're going to make money off the pipeline that Clinton paid you for. They said, no, you've got to come up with about a trillion dollars. So that a year before the World Trade Center, 
a major figure in the American government in the speech before Congress says the only way we can realize the oil in Afghanistan is to put a new government there. But to do something as drastic as that, you needed an excuse that no one could question you on. And they got the excuse, or gave themselves the excuse. It's for your consciousness to realize which way you gotta go. But I know which way we've gone thus far, and they've been our enemies, and never have we known them as our friends. So what I'm gonna do is just a little quick run through a part of, um, and I think I brought the wrong glasses. I don't know. It's, uh, these are some new glasses, so y'all got to buy with me. Um, I just got these last week because I lost the lens out of the other one, so I haven't really ranged them yet where I could really see good. But we're going to just go through some things that we are about in terms of timelines. So you can kind of see who we are. And some of this is being done for the tape for people who are not here so that they can also have information in a certain way that is easy for them to be instructed if this proved to be good instruction. So we know that between 5 to 2.5 million years ago, when nobody else existed, we existed, fossil rocks, ancient skeletal remains have been uncovered in the Rift Valley and surrounding areas. That's in Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania. The Rift Valley actually runs all the way up the Red Sea. It's actually a continuation of the Rift Valley, the Great Rift Valley. Evidence points to a common human ancestry originating in Africa from the emergence of a human-like species in eastern Africa some five, five million years ago. From Hadar, Ethiopia, the 3.18 million year old remains of Lucy were unearthed in 1974. 3.18 million years. They're calling the 17th and 16th century ancient history for them. We can't even get back to our ancient. Because if what I said earlier is true, our ancient has no beginning. See, because there could be no beginning to the universe. There can be no beginning to God. The notion of beginning and end, their so-called Alpha and Omega is false notion. If you have a beginning, something had to be there before the beginning. If you have an ending, there's a presupposition that nothing could exist and nothing can. There can be no existence that is nothing. There is no conception, at least in my intellect, of a notion of beginning. There's simply what the ancient Kemetians call the Hemiwasu. The repetition of the birth, the constant rebirth of the notion of what is into higher levels of being. And so we have to turn to the ancestors so we can see ourselves in that way. 600,000 years ago, widespread of species across Asia, Europe, and Africa. That's when we walked out and populated North America when there was only black folks here. We populated Asia, we populated Europe. That was 600,000 years ago. 200,000 years ago, what we, as, what we identify today as Homo sapiens banded together with others to form nomadic groups. Eventually, the, the people they referred to in Africa as the sand people, the people who we now know as the people that live in, in, in um, Namibia, parts of South, South Africa, and Botswana, and whites sometimes call them bush people and Hottentots, the Khorasan people. These people were the people that were the base for all of us and all of the rest of humanity. And they just had a finding in South Africa, I think last year in this cave, of what is going to prove to be older fossil remains than even what we found in Ethiopia. So the white folks tried to play around Ethiopia with this Semitic thing and Hermetic thing. Well, let them get on down to South Africa and play with that one. That's a hell of a lot of traveling they had to do to go visit somebody, you know. But we know they'll try. But what we've got to do is stay focused on the fact of what and who we are in terms of this expression of the being. 25,000 years ago, rock paintings in North and South Africa were discovered. That's Old Divide, Gorge, and other places. And we see a lot of those rock paintings on television, and we hear on the Discovery Channel and the History Channel where they actually try to portray this off as being them. Even though you're looking right at the black figure with, with uh, anatomical shape like us, meaning good buttocks, nice projection, you know, and where our bodies don't sit, it's hard to explain, our bodies sit 
like this. See, we have legs, buttocks, and then torso. You really got to watch that. When you study physical anthropology, they show you how bodies and skeleton are shaped. We come down and we do a little loop. You see? Others come down and do a duck. Pay attention. You may not have thought it was even important. Check it out. What it has to do with longevity on the scale of evolution. Walking upright for so long, you've adopted the perfect structure to reduce the stress on the upper body because you shouldn't stand up. The heavy is up and, and the narrow is down. We should topple over. But having been at this so long, we have this magnificent stamina. That's why we can dance the way we do and not fall down. If others try to dance with the rhythmic movement we do, they will fall. That's why they don't even try to do it, because they're going to fall down. We don't fall. It's almost like we've got a, what's the thing called, a gyroscope built in. Okay? You ever watch folks, especially, we kind of lost it in America. In North America, we do a lot of dancing with our thighs and with our upper body. But in the Caribbean and Africa, they still dance with their hips. The gyroscope, all of the movements that happen with the rest of the body takes its instruction from this part of the body. And that's deep because that's how we all walk. Think, when you walk, look at how you walk. Watch other people walk. Watch an Asian person walk and wonder why they do like that. Watch a European walk and then watch a black person walk. And watch what part of the body the energy for that walk is emanating from. And you'll, be, you'll get some nice information just observing people. In 6,000 to 4,000, the river people emerge along the Nile, the Niger, and the Congo River in West Africa. The Ashangi of Zaire, the Republic of Congo, introduced mathematics long before Egypt. You've heard Mansetima talk about the Ashangi bones for years. And the Cyclopean stone tombs built in Central African Republic area, the spread of agriculture south of the Sahara Desert, supporting a growing population which mastered animal domestication and agriculture and forced the sand groups into the less hospitable areas. And that's 6,000, 4,000 B.C. By 4,500 B.C., ancient Egyptians began using burial texts to accompany the dead, first known written documents. Now, this is deep. Now, we know, we know by 4,500 B.C. they're doing this. That meant they had to be at least four or five thousand years getting to that. Because you don't just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm going to write. We know we invented writing, and they know it. If you read Plato, you know, they always give us in college the Republic, which is supposed to be Plato's work as edited by Aristotle. But there is a piece that they attribute to Plato, and it's called the Phaedrus. And if you read in the Phaedrus by Plato, in Phaedrus, he says that the Africans gave the world, he's calling us Ethiopians, which is a Greek word for burnt things. He said the Africans give the world, a he names Jews, and he says mathematics, and he says he names a number of the other things, all of the sciences, uh, geometry, etc. He says, but the greatest science of all that they've given to the world is the science of writing itself. Now they've got this in their archive from their main man, and they're still running around running some Hammurabi stuff down running some Greek stuff now. You understand? And this is their main man telling them this. And if you read all of their literature from Thales, which is mostly all tradition that was later written down by others, to Aristotle, they all proclaim the Egyptian to be black, sable. All of them do. And if you go to Egypt today, after you walk past the Serbs and the Tunics who was brought in there by the Turks as slaves, who you now call Arabs, and you walk past the Turks and the other Eurasians, and you get down to Aswan, you begin to see the only Egyptian that's truly there, the black folks. And they are under the feet of this ruling elite of Eurasians who use Islam as a pretext to conquer Egypt. When I get to Islam, for those of you who had a little Muslim background, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, to correct what Brother Brown said, I was never in the nation of Islam. I was only a member of the Muslim Mosque Incorporated that Malcolm founded after leaving the nation. 
And after his assassination, I became imam of uh, that mosque. And I got a chance to go over to the east relative to where you're standing in the west. You understand? Because if you're in China, east is America, you know. So, <laughs> so I went over to relative east, to Mecca, and had quite an experience with those invaders' children. And they are the invaders' children. And even their own literature, their prophet says, I come not to bring a new religion. I come to restore that which was here in the beginning. That means you come to restore the integrity of African culture. So why are we then dealing with somebody else's culture? Otherwise, they must, are they saying their prophet lied? You know? And even if he had said something different, I would then be accusing him of lying. But since he did say something appropriate, I find it acceptable. I could use that. We could work with that. You know? By the time we reach 400, 4,000 to 1,000, ancient African civilization of the Nile Valleys are well established and flourished. And it's important that we begin to understand timelines. Timelines are very important because European can play a real deep trick on you. Most of what he's done has occurred in the 17th and primarily in the 1800th to today. But he'll make you think it happened way back. And most of what he's done is to innovate on stuff that he learned from your scientific text and literature. Okay. Until nearly the 1700s, the only textbook of medicine and surgery in Europe was written in Arabic. But don't get confused, because Arabic is our language. There is no Arabic race. The word Arab connotes people who live in the sand, in the desert. It, it's not a connotation to race. It's a connotation to ecological location. They have turned it into a connotation to race. But the only place you can find a reference or roots to the Arabic language is to look at Medunetja, right? That's hieroglyph, right? The, right? the drawing language, the picture language. That language was put together by the African elite for the illiterate African masses so that they could comprehend the same thing that the elite could comprehend without having formal education. By using symbols from the ecology to express concepts, ideas, and principles, you didn't have to go to college to know what the elite was talking about. This language out of which Hebrew flow is the technical language and the scientific language of Medunetta, which is referred to as the Herodic script. Okay. And then there is this one, the Demotic script, which is Arabic. Alif, Bat, Ta, Ta, Shim, Ha, Ka, Dal, Dal, Raz, Sin, Sin, Sa, Dot. All of them are contained, plus many more symbols than they use in the language that they call the Demotic script, which is really the Murotic script of Sudan, which precedes this script. You understand what I'm saying? If we don't grab and get an understanding of how they've been playing, playing with us and playing us, our ancestors and our scholars have given us the information. We got to do our own research. I'm like skidding over the top of the water, at least letting you know there's some water here. But you got to jump in there and go swimming. You understand? You got to get yourself a diving course and get your scuba diving gear and get on in the pond and get busy comprehending the area that most affects you and that you have the skills to do the most with to transfer ideas to others. This language, you will not find this anywhere else in the world before you find this cursive form of writing in the Sudan. It is the Sudan that the ancients used to call Ethiopia. We've confused the mulatto Arab class that have dominated Ethiopia in the last century as the prototypical Ethiopian. No, the prototypical Ethiopian looked more like all of us in here too like to be the prototypical Ethiopian. This brother with the blue shirt right there, you've come close. When Magisto got into power, they made you think they moved on him because he was Marxist. They moved on him because he was the first true Ethiopian to head Ethiopia in centuries. 
And we don't want really to be confused now about Ethiopia giving us Christianity, because I'm going to get to that in a minute. It was the white folks that gave Ethiopia Christianity. See, the Benzantian put Christianity there, and they headed the Ethiopia church until very recent times. And after Benzantian fell to the Turks, then the Ethiopians got their prelate or church leaders from the Coptic white-skinned church of Egypt. It wasn't until Haile Selassie, Menelik tried in Haile Selassie, that they began to have their leadership come from Ethiopia itself. But the church that we call the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is really a blackenization of the Benzantian church that resists joining the Catholic Church. There is something peculiar about what the Ethiopians and the Coptic did because the notion of the oneness of God is an African notion. It was the, I need to read that so I can get the details, but I'll give you an overview real quick. See, it was the Catholic Church and the formation of the Roman Empire that brought in this Jesus, the Son of God routine. Prior to that, for the first 325 years, all the people who lived during the period and knew a brother who was out here struggling for liberation of his people never saw him as a son of God in that context. When they said son or daughter of God, they were talking about all of us, any of us. And what they were talking about was not so much a biological manifestation, but as a spiritual character quality manifestation, behavioral manifestation. But it was the Catholic Church, which is really the Roman Church. You know, the word Catholic means universal, and church means community. And so this was the universal community that was forced to accept a certain belief backed by the Roman army to enforce those beliefs on other people. Okay. But a group of Africans did break and said, no, we ain't down with that. Well, that group of Africans formed what we know today as the Coptic Church. See, because we can get confused. The Coptic Church of Egypt, which is now dominated by Eurasians, in the north, at least, is closer to the original proposition that we had as a religious presentation than the Ethiopian church, which is the Benzantian church, who accepted the proposition of the Son of God, but refused the leadership of the Roman prelate in Rome, saying, yo, no, you, you, you over the state, you ain't going to be of our church. You understand? So the folks in, in Turkey, what is now Turkey, and that area said, no, we down with God, but we ain't down with you ruling us. You can't be over the church. You can be the state leader, but you can't be the church leader. Because remember, the Roman emperor, emperor becomes the pope. The pope is the Roman emperor. Well, the Benzantian church refused that leadership and says, we will dominate our own life. We will lead our own life. You're not going to rule us from Rome. We're not going to be your empire. And that was the cause of rift between them all of the centuries, even to today. But there was another part of the, the puzzle. The people we call in the Coptics were the black folks who was under Roman domination militarily, who Constantine had brought up to um, Nicaea to say, I want this thing put together like this so that I can socialize this population which is resisting my conquest. And there were some black folks who said, okay, we'll go along look at you trying to do something decent because you did help us get rid of the Persians and the Greeks. And then when they saw the play, they said no. And the brother who led it was Arius. Today they passed Arius in their history as a white boy. There's nothing in the history of this tradition that shows Arius as white. Even though they later assassinate him in Egypt, he doesn't get assassinated before forming the organization that we know today as the Coptic Church. The strongest presentation of this church was in Sudan, near Khartoum. But much of the Christian, African-based Christianity that was not a part of or a child of Roman Catholicism that was based in Sudan was destroyed by the Muslim occupation of Sudan. Even though remnants of it still exist, Ethiopia we know today, or the old Aksum Empire, which is now Ethiopia, took up some of the character of both the Egyptian church, Coptic, and the Sudan Coptic church, which makes it closer to what it should be than the Bansantian church was, or anything near the Catholic church, or the Christian church. All of the Christian church you know are children of the Catholic church, except 
for the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, and the former Sudanic Church. You understand what I'm saying? It's important to know because the theology that then emanates from these people that have practiced such genocide that they then make a swing and tell you it comes from you and then you try to legitimize your being a part of this thing by saying, well, it all started in Africa anyway. No, it didn't all start in Africa. Labels don't let labels fool you. This thing gets deeper because they didn't even call themselves Christian in Africa until recent times. They didn't call themselves no Christian. They, they didn't speak Greek. That wasn't their language. You know? So, think in terms of studying timelines. Look, you create your own timeline based on your body of information. And it'll help you to study. It'll also help you to instruct, especially your children. Because I made the mistake, and I know many of you made the mistake, we are so busy in the world teaching, we forget those offsprings need our teaching to them. We got to set up something special. I'm still wrestling with mine, even though they're in their thirties. I said, I'm not letting y'all go through y'all black enough. So some of them have been out there and they had their little excursions, but they're all back into the fold. It's a struggle. They're mine eternally. There'll never be a moment in time when they're not going to be my children and I'm not going to be their father. And so I'm taking that responsibility because it's mine. I can, I'm not asking nobody for that. That's mine. And I don't want nobody messing with my job because that's my job. I even tell them, don't mess with my job. I won't mess with, my, with your job of being a child of mine. Don't mess with my job of being a parent of yours. And we can get along fine. And they're beginning to get it when they find that I'm not going away. Even when they move out of state, I go visit them once or twice a month until they get, get the point, and then I'll cut back and give them a little more space. But the point is, it's, it's on us and it's up to us. So, I want to bring that piece on the timeline into being. And then I want to do a little piece on Kemet, just some stuff on Kemet, and then we're going to go into these religions, and we'll be ready for the religions by then. Y'all should be warmed up a little bit now, to at least where I'm trying to come from. You know, Theophila Banger, um, you know, he's out at um, San Francisco State now, head of the Black Studies there, but he worked with Shekhanta Diop, and for a while he was seeing Philly at Temple for quite some time. And he told us that there are five realities or dimensions of Ma'at. One, the first dimension is religion. And the first reality is the religions that religion, the religions are sacred. The second dimension is cosmic. And the reality is the cosmos. The third dimension is political. And the realities is the state. The fourth dimension is social and the reality is society. And the fifth dimension is anthropological, and the reality is man. And what uh, Brother Diop, I mean Brother um, Obanga was trying to explain to us is that it's not as simple as we think. And when I break down the disciples and the 99 pearls of faith here in a minute, you see, it's not, it's simple, but it's not simple. Meaning, it's simple, but it requires some study. You've got to put some time into it. We've got to gain some understanding of how this thing works if we're going to get out from under this white man. Remember I mentioned earlier that we won the war in the 60s and then we let him come and take over because we allow Marxist consciousness to direct the black struggle. European Marxist consciousness dominated our attitudes so that when we ran the white policemen out of our community, we then told the black youth, don't become a pig. Well, who the hell did we think was going to become the pig again? We should have seized the opportunity in these inner cities to control the police departments, and we didn't do it. And in a short time, they began to bring their youth back into our community, better trained, better organized, better fortified to be the policemen in our communities again. We should have seized the EMS positions, but we didn't do it. We should have seized the fire department positions, and we didn't do it. We should have begun to groom the people to take the city council seats, 
and we didn't do it. We seem to operate under this need for protest continually. Let's have the enemy in power so I can protest getting him out of power instead of me being the power and then transforming myself beyond an enemy. We didn't go there, and we've lost a great victory that we won. But we need to start trying again. We need not those who are activists, need not abandon the political process, because you don't have another process. And unless you're going to get another process, seize on this process. I'm not saying become pimps to the community. I'm saying become responsible political representatives. But that's not just on the individual you send. That's also on the senders to hold that which you send accountable for the mission you sent them on. Whether the penalty is verbal chastisement or recycling to the ancestral realm, whatever is necessary for you to enforce the integrity of your aspirations as a community on somebody you sent to represent you is what you've got to do. And I, I know you understood what I just said. Okay. And so we've got to get back into the game. If you're talking nationalism, then you've got to seize territory. If you're in an inner city of, in America, the only way you can seize territory is to get the political and economic control over the geographical territory that your people are residing in. If you're going to control territory, then you must seize the police force. That means you've got to send your kids to schools and, and to classes that you put on on Saturdays in your living room and another place, tutoring them to pass these exams for the fire department and police department. And then you have to follow them as they take these exams and mentor them. So if somebody, because we see too many black youth in Philly, as we see in New York, pass the written exam, pass the physical exam, and then some crackers sit up there and, tell, and do an interview and say, you don't pass the psychological. Well, if they pull that, then we're taking them to their maximum of their own court. But since we've never really challenged them, they keep pulling it. You see some totally biologically inferior people stolen around your community as cops, psychologically off balance, and you see your beautiful youth walking around without a job in his own community because this thing said he's psychologically unfit to police his own people while he imports a perverted, sick, racist, underdeveloped consciousness to come and be a brute to hold you in check for trying to be a citizen of the very nation he says he want to protect. So you understand the instructions. We got to become the policeman. We got to become the fireman. We got to become the EMS personnel. We have got to become the nurse. If you don't have the money to go to medical school, then become the lab tech become the nursing aide, become the medical assistant, get in that hospital. If you can't get there, get your children in there so you can give service and protect the sick that goes in there. The majority of the people in the hospital is not doctors, not nurses, it's the other workers. So if you become that majority in the hospital in your area, you keep doctors and nurses in check in your community and you can protect the health care of your people, but you gotta be deliberate. You gotta know what revolution is about. Revolution ain't about raising the gun, an empty hand, pretending you got a gun in it. I did it in the 60s, I was stupid too. Revolution has come, time to pick up the gun. Ain't nothing in there, an empty fist, we ain't got no gun. This fool got all kinds of guns, and we up there with an empty hand. Now yes, it was courageous, that's all we could do. And even that challenged his authority over us. But we got to go beyond that today. Those young men and women were brave. They went up against all of that power with nothing but mind and soul and courage. That's not enough today. They're not afraid of us no more. We're not a mystery no more. So we've got to seize real power. Seize real power. They can't be a community school board or PTA in a school where your children go that you're not on. They can't be a, a police board or community board that you're not on. 
You sit back and you leave it for the so-called petty bourgeois elites and then complain that the petty bourgeois elites ain't doing a damn thing for you. What did you do for you? Take the responsibility to lead. Food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security, economic politics, and culture must be matched by the willingness to serve. And to remember, you know, the word religion, the Greek word which we have in English, religion, means to bind back. Re means to do again, and ligio means to um, bind. So do again is back, and religio is bind. So when you using religion, you're trying to bind back to something. What I'm telling you is what we're trying to bind back is to the integrity of our ancestors' intent. Okay? Remember, we must always remember why. Re means to do again. Member means all of the parts must be pulled together. So when you remember, you bring together all of that which makes you what you are. You understand what I'm saying? So we need to think in terms of religion, and we must always think in terms of remembering ancestors. Never lose that focus. So in every home, there should be at least a shrine to the ancestors that you're conscious of. In every one of your home, you have a shrine to your ancestors, you're unconscious of it. You got a mantle, or you got a TV, or you got a table with all their pictures on it. But you, you're not conscious that that's what you're doing. It's been passed down, but you've lost the reason that you're doing it. Go into any of your house. I guarantee you, you got a table, you got a mantle, you got something where you got the pictures of all the folks that done died. They go Auntie Titty over there. Oh, they go Baba Small, they go Baba Andrew there, and Uncle Peter there, and Uncle John, he did. We got them all there, but let's take it further. Let's make it an altar or a shrine, whatever you want to call it. Clean it, keep it clean. Have them in the order of their birth. Know which one had what skill. And go sometimes and just meditate with them. Light a candle. Candle ain't gonna do a damn thing but burn wax. But what candles like fire often do is allow you to meditate and to focus. Okay? And if you got some good incense, it relaxes you. So you can focus and meditate. Remember it. Everything Granny told you is in your subconscious. If you can meditate and recall back the moment, see, memory isn't recall, it's reliving. So when you go back, you relive the moment. The wisdom is there. But you must focus. And that's what the photographs does. You ain't worshiping no photographs. You're focusing on the image that possessed the wisdom that was shared to you as knowledge that you want to recall. We should have it as one of the things we do. Do you understand? And don't let somebody tell you, oh, you're, you're all worshiping these idols. You ever been into a church that ain't got statues in it? You ever read a holy book, so-called, that ain't talking about some um, saint or, 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 or prophet or somebody? They Abraham you to death and Moses you to death and you want to call up Malcolm Dr. King or Fanny Lou and they say, oh, something wrong with that. Well, if Moses represents the one group what it represents, why can't Fanny Lou represent to me what I want her to represent? She's my goddess. Because it's deep. Let me show you something. Then I'm going to move on down the line I had. Because sometimes you got to move away from your line. You all know there's Passover, don't you? And even some of y'all respect these folks having their Passover. Do you know that Passover is the Jewish community celebrating the murder and genocide of black male youth? Oh, y'all saying black people, y'all y'all didn't know that. If some God gonna send some angel of death to kill the first male born in every house in Egypt, and we know Egypt is black, then they're celebrating the murder of black male youth. Now, if you accept that in your normal consciousness, it drips down to your subconsciousness, and when they kill black male youth today, you think it's normal. Because it was down and good with God. That's why you've got to understand how deep and diabolical that shit really is. It's deep. It's real deep. 
And you got to really see it. Otherwise, they will trip you. They will trick you. And you think you on with just trying to be a human being, showing deference and courtesy to other people? It's deep, man. Here comes Canaan. Let me just give you a little piece, then I'm going to get back to the reading piece. Because I'll tell you, I'm going to take a little time, if you all don't mind. Right? There's a people that live in Ghana. They live in the capital city called Accra. These people call themselves Ga. Ga Adangbe. Ga Ablade. They said that they are the Canaanites. And they got ran out of their land by some folks called the Israelites. Ain't that deep? Because we got folks running around saying they're black Israelites. Well, now these black folks say they're the Canaanites. Now, when you read the Bible, their text, the Torah, it tells you the Canaanites were black people. Matter of fact, the very word that connotes them means black. And the mother of Solomon and David were Canaanites, and both of their names connotes black. Ain't that something? And here are these black folks that say that they sojourn out of there when this invasion comes. So then you must then raise a fundamental question, then, who was the Hebrew Israelites? And are they who we think we are? Or just as blacks became black Muslims because it seemed like a way out of white Christianity, blacks became black Hebrew because it seemed like a way out of white Christianity. We've got to raise it, and we've got to be serious and not be afraid. Because we don't have to create history, because we've got real stories. These people, these Canaanites, if you go to Ghana in early August, from late June or early July to the end of August, no drums are played in their area. No noise is made because they're dealing with ancestors. That's a long period of time. At the end of that period, it's called Homowa, the new year or the renewal. And you know what they do for Homowa? Oh, they make a nice food called puck poi, which cleans you out. Because it's a new year, you've got to clean up to move on. They go to this pit in Ghana, and they take this red clay and mark their doorway so that the angel of death will not stop at their house. Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> Look like somebody stole our stuff and called it their stuff, don't it? And when Homawa is finished, a beautiful ceremony and experience and when you commune with the people and you sit down and you hear the history told and note that most of us over here are God people or Ewe people or Akan people or Yoruba people or Bakongo people. That's not their story, that's our story. That they tell That's us. So when you start hearing those stories, you have to ask some questions. What's going on, like Marvin said? What's really going on? And we're going to begin to see that these people came back with their six cells from the mountains. I don't need to go into some of this because I've already gone over it. And we know that in ancient Kemet, long before anyone wrote a Bible, Torah, or Koran, in a book that we can now access called the Pyramid Text, you can find the creation story almost to the letter of the story that's in the Torah or Old Testament. Okay. In the pyramid text, we talk about the great primordial waters of noon and that there was darkness. In the Torah, they talk about and darkness was on the face of the waters. They talk about and God and we talk about Amun, or the Hidden One, that out of which raw light will come, you know, as a manifestation. But first will rise out of the water the primordial hill we call Ptah. Matter out of liquid energy, or matter out of liquid matter. What do they call that? It's quantum physics today. They'll make reference to that. But we express that in the pyramid text many, many thousands of years ago. That solid matter came into being out of liquid matter. 
and the interaction between the moisture and the energy and the matter produce, produce the enzymes that produce what we call life on the planet in the form of shoe, air, tefnut, moisture, geb, earth, nut, the energies that we call the sky, because there's no sky, you understand? This is different forms of energy giving us the light. Out of that, we get Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys, the prototype for the human family. This Genesis story, which I didn't go into, but I've referenced where you can find it in the pyramid text, is at least 6,000 years older than Torah. So those who wrote the Torah lived in the land where this was preached every day, and don't tell me they didn't hear it. We know that the Tenth Commandment comes out of the 42 admonitions of Ma'at, which is a part of 142 admonitions, which is a part of at least 400 admonitions. So that somebody took 42 and synthesized it into a very elementary 10. Imagine now, we are in Egypt, and what we did in our last moment to make sure we stood right, we go before the God in our spirit and our physical, and says, I have not lied. I take responsibility in the first person. I have not committed adultery. I have not brought tears to anyone's eyes. I have not eaten the fruits of the God. I have not called God's name in an unuseful way. But if you're primitive, you says, you shall not do this. And you shall not do this because the child is being instructed. But the parent is saying, I have not done this thing. Yet they want to play you off so you don't even see it. And sometimes we pretend. Those of us, many of us in this room, we've known for years about Ma'at. Because I know many of the faces I've seen for years as we've struggled. But even we, feeling alone, have hung on to their tent rather than master our 42. Even we alone have stuck to just lip service rather than inculcating it in our character and let it become a manifestation of our behavior. You understand me? So it is important that we realize, I see the young people in the back. I'm 56, 57 soon. I'm going to be checking out of here soon. Most of us who are in our 50s, we ain't going to be here 50 years from now. Maybe one of us, maybe. We will be with the ancestors. We will again become zinc and iron and iodine. We will become the dust. 90% of the water in us will evaporate even through the coffins they seal us in and go back into the sky as cloud and rain down as water to be drunk by those who are unaware of the consumption of other human beings. But you young ones, if you learn from us well, without being afraid to let us love you, because the enemy told you if I love you, he will not reward you. Let us love you enough to give you knowledge. And then you gain your own knowledge, and you be twice as big and twice as powerful as we could be. And then we will feel safe when you give birth to us again in your intercourse, because that's how we come back, as you come back. You give birth to us. We were called into being by our parents. We will call them back into being. I was so surprised that my mother, who passed in August, told my youngest daughter, she says, I'm not afraid to die. She says, you know, I was afraid a few years ago. She says, I'm not afraid to die. This was two weeks before she died. She says, because Mama, that's my grandmother, her mother, called me into being and Papa. 
And I call my children into being, and they call y'all into being, meaning my daughter. And she says, and I'm going to go for a while, and then y'all will call me back into being. We've been doing that unconsciously for too long. Let's, not, let's now do it consciously. That's why there was so much emphasis on ethical, moral character, so that you can be the physical, spiritual, healthy creature that would call into being a physical, spiritually healthier creature than yourself, so that he could stand against the forces of destruction. If you watch that movie, The, um, the Mummy, you will see the attack upon us that's subliminally going down. But it's not just a movie. They are informing their people on how to view our expressing ourselves as ancient and Cometian people. They're identifying the symbols of our most sacredness and saying they should be considered profane. They're telling their people never allow this wisdom to rise up because it will destroy you, so you must destroy it despite its wealth. You remember when they go in the chamber with all the wealth? They were so busy trying to deal with the destruction of the spirit thing that they left all that gold up in there, except for the little bit the cat got because the other boy stole that and left it on the donkey. The thing is, more than all the wealth he possessed is destroying his essence. And they set out to do that. If you remember Stargate, not the TV series, not the movie, they took the most sacred symbols of Kemet and demonized it. Because that's the point we were at our high point. Ass gagging, this going on and that going on. They had to put a stop to that thing. They had to dampen that. So they understand they don't have to send a, 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 a what the guy used to ride on the horse and go warn people. They just put it in the movie and they reach their people. They put it on the internet and they reach their people. You've got to understand, you think you go out for entertainment, that, that's them sending a message to white folks and to whatever Negroes they can get to listen in their confusion. So you've got to be conscious. You've got to be aware of this thing. Now let me try to cover a few more things. I want to look at this piece concerning, I did deal with the Ethiopian question, but I just want to tell you the year it's important that you do have the year. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church, also called Ethiopian Church in Giz, Tiwadu, independent Christian patriarch in Ethiopia, holding to monophysite. And that's the notion of there's one God. He has no son. He wasn't given birth to by none. The same notion that Muhammad, when he traveled in Egypt and Ethiopia, taken Khadija caravan, learned about and establish Islam as a result of. Doctrine, that is, that Christ has only one nature. The church organized the honorary primacy of the Coptic Patriarch of Alexandria. It is headquartered in Addis Ababa. Ethiopia was Christianized in the fourth century AD by two brothers from Tyre, and then they named them. What had happened, this guy was going on down the Red Sea and his ship wrecked, but his two children, two princes, survived. One of them got very close with the prince of Ethiopia because they could read and write. The king of Ethiopia used the enemy to teach his son. So when his son became king, he became a Christian. There's always a way they get it, you know? We send our children out to our enemy every morning. But what do you think we're gonna get back home every evening? The enemy, you know? unless you set up something else, Saturday school, after school, to put your values there and teach them to challenge what they're getting, even though the tooling and the training we're getting from the enemy is necessary and useful, the education must come from the family on how to use the tools and the training. And that's why Saturday schools and after schools is absolutely essential for us in our involvement in PTAs and school boards to make sure of the integrity of our children's uh, institution. 
And so I'm going to do a little bit on Judas. Because this is important, because these are some real demons. See, we say white people, but white Americans are controlled spiritually by Jewish Americans. And the way they keep spiritual dominance over white Americans, because the economic system that the Jewish Americans set up controls the American system of economics. You understand? And so it gets real deep. But I'm not going to get too much into their political thing. But I just want to look at their, their thing a little bit, just for history's sake. So I'm looking at Judaism. And the holy book is called the Torah, the book of Moses, the Old Testament. And you can read Dr. Ben's outline of the three major Western religions. Abraham, the father of Judaism, was told by God, according to them, to move his family from Ur in the present-day Iraq to Canaan or present-day Palestine or northeast Africa, is what this place really was and is. The reason to become the father of a nation who would believe in and worship one God who is called Jehovah or Yahweh. Famine in the land soon drive Abraham into Kemet, the land of Egypt, according to them in 1670, and according to Dr. Ben. Now, this becomes important because here they're telling us that there are the people of monotheism. And they like to tell you as you read books and watch the television how Jews create monotheism. Then why are you being sent from your monotheism land to a polytheism land for safety in monotheism? Does that make sense? Why would I send you down to Africa if they ain't down with monotheism to be safe from Iraq, who's supposed to be down with monotheism. Ain't that something? Now, Abraham come on down to Africa with his lion, two-faced, good-for-nothing self. First thing he does, Pharaoh look at his wife, Sarah, and say, boy, you sure enough got a fine woman here. You know our brothers, brother, even when they were Pharaohs, we were so jobbing. First thing he do is lie and say, oh, boss, this, this ain't my wife, this my sister. Pharaoh said, man, oh, man, here you have anything you want. So come on, baby, go with me. Go with the fairy. Hang on up in the palace. Pharaoh get the woman in his bedroom, thinking not that he's violating anybody. He's making himself another wife because he was allowed to have many wives. Angel stepped out and said, yo, bro, the woman married. That's a violation of the principle by which you live. Pharaoh jumps too, sends for Mo Abraham. The man, what's wrong with you? How you going to jam me up with God like that? By lying. But they tell you Pharaoh is the evil one, and Abraham the good one. Abraham lied. Pharaoh didn't violate the woman when he realized this was a wife and not a sister. He not only bring the woman back to her husband, he gave them wealth untold and some land to live on. But they tell you Pharaoh the evil one and Abraham the good one. That's deep. Your consciousness don't even pick it up because you believe so in the teacher because the teacher has cast himself in the image of the God that you don't question obvious stuff that comes forth obvious stuff. They run deeper than that. Take this piece. This will give you some definition. Adam is a symbol of the, this is just a metaphorical stuff. They say Adam is a symbol of the lower mind, energized from the desire plane, but receptive of impressions from the higher nature. This is the fallen Adam. The Kabbalah describes four Adams the two highest of which are celestial and spiritual. The third Adam is the terrestrial Adam, made up of dust and placed in the Garden of Eden. Now they claim with all of these non levels of understanding while running to you that there's a man named Adam. When the word Adam itself in their language means earth or soil. The Hebrew word Adam, which connotes more directly red, 
Hence, Adam, the ground, or earth. Genesis, fifth, second. They even say it. So you got to study that literature, not just let them preach and tell you and then you believe what he's saying. He made my mama change her name by lying about Mary Magdalena being a whore and a harlot. You cannot find one reference in their Bible where Magdalena is called a whore or a harlot. Not one reference. The reason preachers in from their secret societies was told to defame Mary Magdalena because she was the wife of their so-called Christ. And if you read the book, it'll tell you that. Now, any of you sisters here, as fine as y'all is sitting up here on front, but no disrespect, if you're a day or so older than me, y'all still fine. If I got to anointing y'all and carrying on, your husband ain't gonna like it at all. But yet Magdalena was anointing my man with oil. You know how much some olive oil cost back then? Olive oil was like gold. So if that sister was anointing, she young, that was her man. That was the notion of affection that's equal to me kissing and embracing you today. But it goes deeper. When they had that wedding feast, remember they had the wedding feast? According to the Hebrew culture, only the groom can bring the wine to the wedding. Who turned the water to wine? It doesn't matter what metaphor they use for him to bring that wine, Jesus brought the wine. In Hebrew tradition, the family of the groom served the wedding party. Read the literature. Mary, Jesus' brother James, who was older than him, by the way, and his sister Sarah was serving the wedding party. But y'all don't read the literature. Y'all just listen to the preacher. Read the literature. Both of those things tell you that the only person there that could have been the groom was Jesus. And remember the wedding was held out for a couple of days because who wasn't there? Jesus. Well, you can't have a wedding without a groom. It gets deep. Jesus and Mary had, Magdalene had a beautiful son. You know about the son, but it never dawned on you because you ain't read the literature with an African mind. The son was called in the literature Barabbas. Bar in Hebrew means son of. Rabbis means the Lord. They just throw it right up in your face and you miss it. Bar Rabbis, son of the Lord, was set free while the Lord turned himself in to die. Isn't that what a father does in African culture? Isn't the next generation entitled to more opportunity than the older generation? So if one's got to be sacrificed, the older generation sacrifice themselves for the youth. But he didn't die since Jesus was a juju man. I remember I did a lecture in London, and they chased me all over England. And the lecture series was called Jesus, over your man. Man, they had me sleeping on people's living room floor and hiding by night and moving behind my day, moving by night. Yeah. Jesus Christ, the opium man. When they saw that fly, everybody, the white folks were looking for me and black folks. But Jesus was an opium man. All African priests, all Egyptian priests had to learn the fundamentals of science, psychology, and medicine. Jesus was trained in Egypt. What we know of Jesus when he's a little boy and Herod want to kill him according to their tradition, God says, take my man on down to Africa, to Egypt. Every time they got in trouble, their God sent them to Africa. Now, we ain't peeped that, right? Abraham gets in problem, God sent him to Africa. Isaac or, or, or Joseph get in trouble, God sent him to Africa, make him rich. Jacob and Esau and all of them, the rest of them get in trouble. God sent them down there to join Joseph, make them rich. They needed a prophet. God went down to Africa and got Moses. Jesus is going to be killed. God sent him to Africa for safety. Now, come on. How much more y'all need? Even their own literature tell you that God don't do nothing worth doing until after he checked with the African folks. <laughs> According to their literature. What makes Jesus an obia man? Read the literature. He is on the cross. He's captured about 9 or 10 in the morning. By the time, well, some say 2 or 3 in the morning. By the time all the proceedings is done, it's nearly afternoon. And they sentence him to death. It's a Friday afternoon. Hebrew Sabbath begins 
on Friday at sundown. You cannot bury anyone on the Sabbath so that he doesn't get to the cross because the sun is well past midday, according to their literature, until 2 or 3. It takes someone approximately 2, 3, 4 days to die on the cross because you really die from suffocation from these muscles in your neck, choking you to death as the weight of your body pull you down. So they said, well, they stabbed him in the side, and that's how they killed him, and um, they can get him buried real quick. That's why he had to go to the tomb of um, Joseph of Arimathea, which was one of his disciples and a wealthy man who was in the Sanhedrin to be buried because that tomb was close by Golgotha where he was supposedly executed. All that sounds real good. They got that all wrapped up. Sounds good, right? But listen again. He says, I thirst. They do what? They give him vinegar and gall to drink. Right? Look, vinegar back then, there's no word for vinegar back then. The word is connoting what we call apple cider, which is fermented apple juice, right? But there was something else, gall. Look up the word gall in Hebrew. Gall is the Hebrew word for pure poppy juice, okay? You take pure poppy juice, soften the bitter taste with some apple cider, and what you've got is something that stops the body metabolism almost to a standstill, meaning your brain does not require the oxygen because you've slowed the heart down to such a degree, the body, since the body metabolism is slow, the heart don't need to pump blood, so even when I stick a sword in there, you're not going to bleed to death because the heart's not pumping. So the brother, being a juju man, he said, yo, I can get up and fake my death. Let them let my son go. I know how to get out of this is. So when he goes to the tomb, we know the real juju people is them sisters. Y'all know how y'all do things, right? That's why the brothers, they all went to the tavern having a little wine. But did the women leave that tomb? No. They were the ones that came and told the brother that he lived. And when Thomas them caught up with him, he wouldn't know spirit. He told him, if you don't believe it's me, stick your finger in the hole. It's flesh he's referencing. So you need to read their literature because they didn't ever think you would be reading the dang thing. So they didn't hide stuff that deeply. But if you let them tell you about the literature and not read it, then you really have a problem. We know all of the good things about the Hebrew tradition and the creation and the Tenth Commandment and the da da and the da 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 and about paradise and all of that. Let me give you some real stuff on them Hebrew folks. I'm not going to even deal with the stuff Dr. J talk about the slavery. I'm just talking about the Bible, Torah. Somebody sent me, I think Hunter Adams sent me this over the internet. I said, this is going to go good down its belly. If we follow our Bible to the letter, we'd be no better than the Taliban. The stuff in the following Bible quotes is so blatantly racist, I actually feel like a little bigot myself just for posting it. Here's a Bible verse that says, God told the Jews it is okay to keep non-Jews as slaves. Deuteronomy 20th, 10th to the 16th. Moses tell his people, to slaughter all slots, just like the Taliban does, innocent men and male children, and to use virgin girls as Jewish sex slaves, Numbers 31st, 7th, 18th. The Israelites war against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and slew every male, and the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones, and they took as booty all their cattle, their flocks, and all their goods. All the cities in the place where they dwelt and all the encampments they burned with the fire and took all the spoils and all the booty, both of men and of beasts. Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls you have not known by man by lying with him, keep alive for yourself. That's your Bible, folks. Y'all didn't read it. It gets worse. The Bible says Jews shouldn't harm each other, but it's okay to beat, 
the crap out of non-Jews for money. <laughs> it's real bad. Deuteronomy 15, second and third. I'm giving you the verses so you can go check the stuff out. Right? He, the Jew, should not press his fellow Jew for payment. The foreigner or the Gentile, you may press him for payment. And here the Bible says it's okay for Jews to rip off non-Jews. Deuteronomy 23rd, 19th, 20th. You, may not, you must not make your brother pay interest. Interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything on which one may claim interest. You may make a foreigner pay interest, but your brother or fellow Jew, you must not make pay interest. Here's a quote that says it's okay for Jews to suck non-Jews dry. Isaiah 60, 16. You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall suck the breast of kings. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. He's a particularly racist passage in which, here's a particular passage in which it is clearly said that non-Jews should be killed. Isaiah 60, 10, 12. Foreigners shall rebuild your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. Your gates shall be open continuously. Day and night they shall not be shut, that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. procession. For the nation or kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. And here's a quote where God supposedly tells the Jews to abuse non-Jews as laborers. And strangers shall stand and feed your flock. Strangers shall be your plowmen and veneers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. Men shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. And while we are having so much fun with ancient scripture, why not throw in a quote from the Jewish Talmud, the Jewish Bible, in which it says, Jews shall lie about all this and deny that their Bible contains racist material against non-Jews. In the Salut Utsubut, the book of Jori Dai 17, a Jew should and must make a false oath when the Goyim, that's a non-Jew, asks if our books contain anything against them. That word is spelled S-Z-A-A-L-O-T-H hyphen U-T-S-Z-A-B-O-T-H in the book of J-O-R-E, D-I-A, chapter 17. And you honestly think the Bible of the Jewish Talmud is not just as violent as Koran? Well, here's a neat little quote from the Talmud that calls for Jewish holy war against all non-Jews and heathens. Prayer said on the eve of Passover, Christianus and Talmud Judirum quotation from Synagogue Judaica. We beg thee, O Lord, indict thy wrath on the nations not believing in thee and not calling on thy name. Lay down thy wrath on them and inflict them with the tie wreath. Drive them away in the wrath and crush them into pieces. Take away, O Lord, all bond from them. In the moment, indict all this believer. Destroy in a moment all foes of the nation. Draw out with the root, disperse and ruin unworthy nations. Destroy them, destroy them immediately in every moment. Now you wonder why people could do what they did to you in slavery, do what's happening to the Palestinian. If they believe that God told them to behave like this, then that's how they're behaving. You're trying to look and say, well, why are they acting like that? Because you believe one way. You've confused your calling yourself a Christian with your being a Christian. You're not a Christian. You just call yourself that. It was a safe label. You're an African. Even when you read Christian doctrine, you're still going to try to do it in an African way. But see, he's seeing something else. I'm going to just read two more. And according to the Talmud, and non-Jews who tries to share the Jewish wealth should be killed. If it can be proven that someone has given the money of Israelites to the Goyim, a way must be found after prudent consideration to wipe him off the face of the earth. That's in Choshishim Ham 
15, Chershechen, C-H-O-S-C-H-E-N-H-A-M-M. So you need to understand that people have as a theocratic belief the right to destroy you from the face of this earth. So when you see them acting like they do, it ain't just that somebody got some bad character. This is their belief. This is how they live. This is what they talk from the time they're children. Oh, no, I'm gonna get, yeah, I'm gonna get to ours. Our stuff need to be at the end so we can kind of really get into it. Just a couple more. Mark 9, 43, 45. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Now, if this is Christian doctrine, why were they griping that the Saudis chop off your hand if you see your stuff? Y'all better listen, because see, y'all ain't really understanding because a Muslim, and most Muslims are ignorant and backwards and don't know that the Quran, this book, is made up of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the last revelations to Prophet Muhammad. Everything the Jews believe in, the Muslim believe in. Everything the Christian believe in, the Muslim believe in. The only gripe they got with the Christian, they said, Jesus ain't the son of God, he's a prophet. But everything else, they're down with it. And then they got their own stuff up in here called the last revelation. Y'all understand? So you think you got a buddy running to the Muslim, yo, 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 it's the same family. Okay? There's a book written by some brothers. It's hard to get. It's called Egyptian Sacred Science in El Islam. And it's written by a brother named Rafiq Bilal and Thomas Goodwood. I think brother Thomas passed away a couple of years ago. These brothers is deep because in, in this book, Egyptian Sacred Science and El Islam, they really get off into trying to show you some stuff. I'm going to just take one piece and leave the rest of the book. There's a surah in there called the Surah to Asa, and that's the way they say it in Arabic. But it's spelled the same way Asar, Osiris, is spelled. In Surah to Asa, it is a very short surah, and it's about time. What most people don't understand, the story of Isis, Osiris, and Horus, and Seth is about time. It is a metaphorical take using anthropomorphic symbols by Africans on how we invented time to measure our expansion of energy in order to produce substance for ourselves and how we were able to predict phenomena and conditions by knowing the repetitions of when something would occur. So that involved both calendar creation and clock creation, but the fundamental basis of that whole creation is the story of Isis, Horus, Osiris, and Seth. Always Horus is battling Seth when? At dawn and at twilight, right? Osiris is the night. Ra is the light. Neither is bad because there's something beautiful happening in all space, but the battle takes place when the transition period comes, at twilight and at dawn. If you begin to study as yes, it's up, you can cut the locks if you wish, or you continue to wear them. The same thing in Botswana in South Africa. You, to be a priest or priestess, you lock your hair. The same thing in Nigeria. You may, and in, in Benin, you may choose to cut it at the end of the three years if you wish. But the locking of the hair is a very sacred phenomena that referenced the most ancient ancestors at the time when we had not yet invented a comb or brush, and our hair just naturally, you know, locked itself and matted itself. So that is what that reference back to that sacred period in time. And so this is 1843. B.C., and this is Brother Amen Ament. Is there any doubt whether this pharaoh is an African with locks? But if you, don't, if you think that's beautiful, watch a frontal view, even though they've broken the brother's nose off. Is that clearly an African, as Agnathanus, who was pharaoh of ancient Egypt? 
So all the joke, their confusing stuff, that they don't know who the Egyptians were. No, they're saying we don't want to accept who the Egyptians were, but we know who the Egyptians were. We are they. Closer than you think. Again, this is the Pharaoh. In 2010 BC, they had white paint and black paint and red paint. He didn't paint his skin red like they make, like to make reference to. He didn't paint his skin white. He painted his skin black, his garments white, and his crown red. He knew more about how he looked than we do. And we must accept the information he's passed down through time. Okay, that's King Mentahotep, the second in the 11th dynasty. And of course we know that in order to build this, you must have arrived at Pi to build it on the scale it was built on. And if you read the papyrus uh, that they now call the Musk or the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, you'll see that they had already arrived at Pi by the time they built this as a mathematical formula. In the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus, the original of which has been stolen and sits in the British Museum, and you can go and see it, they had already put together a formula that we call the Pythagorean Theorem, except this was 2,000 years before Pythagoras that the Rhine Mathematic Papyrus was done. We know that this is called in Washington the Washington Masonic Monument, but we know that this is an African monument that's dedicated to the manhood, to fatherhood. And in, in our mythology, it is said that the woman used this to symbolize fatherhood. Because in the story, the metaphor of Osiris, they, they cut off his penis and the catfish ate it. So instead of having 14 pieces, there was only 13 pieces. So the number 13 don't come from them in Good Friday. The number 13 came from this time when it was connoted by us as being good luck, they connoted as being bad luck. But to restore the regenerative process of the male and the continu continuity of the race, the women created a penis that could not be destroyed for perpetuity, emanating out of the earth itself, the tekanism, which represents fatherhood, and that's why it's the symbol of George Washington, the father of this nation. They know what they were doing. And then there's the Great Pillar Temple. This is older than the Parthenon. This is older than anything in, when Greece and Rome were still living in straw huts when this was built. So when you look at the Great Pillar Temples in Philadelphia and Washington and government buildings, you're not looking at Greco-Roman architecture. You're looking at African architecture. The Great Pillar Temples of the Nile Valley proceed by hundreds and hundreds and not, not thousands of years any pillar temple in Rome or Greece. And to go again into our great Nile Valley civilization, taken from a uh, little reading from um, the book of the coming forth by, no, I'm not going to do that one, um, but looking at the Hosea, the book of Ptahotep, because it makes the point of God real clear. Now, the book of Ptahotep is considered to be the oldest textbook in the world older than any of the other literature as an instrument of instruction. So you're talking about thousands of years before the Bible and the Torah and the Koran, who say they're the monotheists, right? Now listen to this. Be not arrogant because of your knowledge. Take counsel with the ignorant as well as with the wise. For the limits of knowledge in any field have never been set, and no one has ever reached them. Wisdom is rarer than emeralds and yet it is found among the women who gather at the grindstone. If you are a leader and command many, strive for excellence in all you do so that no fault can be found in your character. For ma'at, the way of truth, justice and righteousness is great. Its value is lasting and has remained unequal and unchanged since the time of its creator. It lies as a plain path before even the ignorant and those who violate its laws are punished. Although wickedness may gain wealth, wrongdoing has never brought its wares to a safe port. In the end, it is ma'at, the way of truth, justice, and righteousness that endures and enables the upright to say, it is the legacy of my father and my mother. 
In this passage, we're talking about the one God. In this passage, we're talking about justice. In this passage, we're talking about balance and harmony. In this passage, we're talking about the destruction of ego. In this passage, we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that makes up the foundation of Western literature, and yet this document is thousands of years older than any Western literature. And so we need to really reference back. We know that in 10,000 to 6,000 BC, we had created the stellar calendar. Those black people I just showed you had created the stellar calendar. By 4,000 BC, we had created the solar calendar. By 3,760, we had written our first creation story in the pyramid text. By 3,100 to 4,100, we had begun a dynastic period under the Nubian name Aha, or Nama, or many. And what we know as modern Egypt came into being. And so it is important that we reference back the netters, which are the qualities and attributes of God as advanced by the ancient Kemetan people. Men equals lightning. Hathor, which is the head of the cow, represent motherhood. Neth, who represent arrows as the hunter, or that one which can pursue and track the character of the human being by the actions you leave behind. Or Cyrus equals a Romula in the Yoruba system and represents the notion of regeneration and resurrection, as well as Olokun, which is the bottom of the ocean. There's a point in which the sunlight penetrates water, and at the point that is called photosynthesis. But the point at which the sunlight cannot penetrate, that's the point the African call Olokun. Out of that comes the pla planktons and the amino acids and the other things that when struck by sunlight produces life as we know it. So our people understood very high science. So Yimaya is that part of the water that is penetrated by sunlight, and Olokun is that part which sunlight cannot penetrate. So when we think of Ptah, we think about the celestial fire. Hapu, we think of the celestial waters. And those are the netters of ancient Egypt. The three major principles in ancient Egypt, the Ankh, the Wasp, and the Jed. The Ankh represent life. The Wasp represent prosperity. And the Jed represents stability. So they weren't just names they were using. They were talking about quality and attributes of the human character. If we went to Uganda or we went to um, um, Rwanda, Burundi, there is a concept known as Mantu. And when in that language system of the Bantu language, in terms of the suffix and prefix they use for human being and for human, the person or human being is Bantu. The human is Mantu. I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this in a minute, right? For place is Kentu. For thing is Bentu. For being or state of being is Kentu. The suffix Ba would be meaningless, which represents person, right out of the Egyptian person, would be meaningless without into. Into is the essence of God, and it runs through all things as the perfect. Place, you say, ki, kin to. But the ki cannot stand. It's, it has no meaning in the language by itself. Only when you add the, self, the perfect, which is God, into, do you then have a notion of place, kin to. Thing, bin to. Be by itself has no meaning as a suffix in the language. Only when you add the prefix God into do you have a thing. It goes to show you that the entire linguistic perspective of our people involved God as the central aspect of its expression. And being can to, ka, the ka being from Egypt, we're talking about Rwanda now, the ba, the spirit from Egypt, we're in Rwanda. When you add into, you get person and you get being. So the meduneta is not something that some other folks had up in Egypt. This is something the people from the southern part in Central Africa took to the Nile Valley. Because the river don't run from the north to the south, the river runs from the south to the north. And before you had the technology to navigate against current, 
people flowed with the current to populate the areas they went into. And so we come into my beloved Ifa, Ifa Orisha. Some people refer to it as Vudun. Vudun is an African word, and the word Vudun literally connotes the God. In the Ewe language, they say Voodoo Daha. It means the godly man. The word comes out of the language which is used by the Fon people of Benin, the Ewe people of Togo and Ghana, the Ga people of Accra, Plains in Ghana, and the manifestation of these communities have been manifest in New Orleans, southern Mississippi, Martinique, Montserrat, and Haiti. A lot of time when people want to talk about voodoo, they want to leave black Americans out. Everybody wants to think, we ain't got nothing. And when they reference our hoodoo, they try to make fun of it. But we use hoodoo to connote the botanical part of our system that we managed to maintain. Since we weren't allowed to practice overtly the religion, we then practiced what we could. We could practice the botanica or the herbal medicine, which is called root in some cases, or hoodoo in other cases. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that system, which most people call the Yoruba, but that's not the name of the system. Yoruba is simply a people that has more than any people survive with the system intact. But Yoruba connotes the people. And the people Yoruba, I'll show you later, Yoruba is a Medunetra word that's used to describe a people who trace their history from the Nile Valley. All of these people, the Fon people of Benin, the Ewe people, the Ga people in Yoruba, all trace themselves from the Nile Valley. Okay? In their oral tradition, as I've interviewed and spoken with the priests and the priestesses in those places, they all trace their oral tradition. Some of the information you can get, you can't get unless you are an initiate. I'm initiated in the Yoruba tradition, I'm initiated in the Akan tradition, and I'm initiated in the God tradition. And I do have access, and Reverend Brown, who journeyed with me to Africa, know when I hit Africa, I'm Nana on the real side from the president of the nation down, which I think I've quite earned it, because when you done fall out and passed out and all them ceremonies when you're too old to take it. See, if I'd done this stuff when I was young, I would have been cool. But I'm trying to do this stuff when I'm in my 40s and 50s, and these are things young men do when they're in their teen years. That's why they do the initiation when they're teenagers, because it's hard work and it's a lot of pressure and stress on you. But <clears throat> the fauna of Benin called these Vudun, the Ifa Orisha or Yoruba belief as we like to refer to it. And I want to just tell you what the Yoruba believes. We believe there's one supreme God. We believe there's no devil. Except for the day you were born and the day you are supposed to die, there's not a single event in one's life that cannot be forecast and if necessary, change. We believe your spirit lives on after death and can reincarnate through blood relatives. We believe you are born with a specific path. Divination serves as a road map to your path. We believe our ancestors exit and must be honored, exist and must be honored, respected and consulted. We believe the Arisha are the forces of nature, those quality and attributes of God that manifest themselves in nature at its and culture you must be instructed and informed by your ancestors, and that means you must be into this tradition that I'm talking about. And in the end, we must make sure that we talk about the building blocks for the race, and we must talk about self, and construction and configuration of self, family, construction and configuration of family, community or neighborhood, construction and configuration of community or neighborhood, race, a reconstruction and configuration of the race, and nation, construction of our nation. And if we get clear on that, by dealing with substance, management, and ethics, by understanding sociology, psychology, and ecology, ecology being economic, sociology being law, psychology being culture, and using Ifa Arisha to bond us together with a methodology and with rules and regulations that help us to navigate through all these things, we will soon find that 
our generations will know freedom. And when they give birth to us again, we will be in the world that we created in the beginning and not in the world that have been violated by a mutation of the creation. I'm tired now. I have to thank you very much. I thank you.